You're listening to iCannabisRadio.com. Hey, and we're back. Wow, that's really loud. Um, oh, so, um, another day of uh, the Hemp Connoisseur Radio. And uh, I have a full studio here today. And then we also have a caller coming in. So this is like the fullest show we've done in a while. That's not true, last... Was last full because I wasn't here yeah, for it you because here. you know it I had to crazy. interview. I interviewed twelve hundred people last Thursday. Were you hiring? Yeah, we were hiring. We we're hiring for uh, you know ad sales reps because we're expanding and we need like more people out there because there's so many companies that want to be in this industry what, or a part of this industry Don't that you know I'm not we need more the people. Mic. Are we, are we yell- like, having a show? Are we going to have yes, a conversation? Yes, we're having a show. Okay. He's yelling at me for touching So, the I'm sorry. Let me just give a pre, you know, a preview of the show here. Um, uh, coming up at 3.30, I mean 4.30. That would be the time, 4.30 miles standard. Uh, we're going to have um, Matt McLean from Recreator Apparel. Um, and this is a really cool company. They actually did a Kickstarter campaign. So, you can go on to kickstarter.com and uh, put in Recreator uh, Hemp Apparel. And you'll be able to find those guys, and you can donate. But they've actually already hit their limit, which is awesome. But I guess anything more is just gravy. I thought you only could get what you asked for on Kickstarter, but you can actually get more. No, if you do I think really well. you have to like uh, up to a certain point or yeah, something. Yeah, a certain point, and then um, whatever that is that you say you're raising, like there's like a percentage or like a fee that goes back to the Kickstarter. Gotcha. Well, of course, uh, an Amazon website, and a whatever, yeah. whoever's like, yeah. And so, then, yeah, and then anything after that, I think. Yeah, but they hit, their, they hit their goal, which is awesome. There's a few companies that have hit their goals, but most companies have not. In fact, I, I didn't even realize one of my ex-partners back in the day had done a Kickstarter campaign for us to get our website up and running, which did not do well. But, um, but that's because, you know, but people know who we are now, so maybe we would have done better. Um, but also joining us in the studio today is uh, two of our fans, two fans of iCannabis Radio, actually, and they had no idea they were going to be on the so show. they're not but our fans? They're just fans of iCannabis Radio? Of the entire iCannabis Radio family. We don't, do we have fans? We do have fans. Like you and I? Well, I don't know. I do don't we have know. like a fan group? I don't know. I don't like, you know, get Follows, phone calls. Follow or, religiously might be. Different. There you go. There you go. But I'm sorry. So we have Butch and Appalachian Man. And uh, they've been visiting us from Tennessee. Yes. yes. And they actually booked a flight to come out here for our, our Marijuana no, Madness we event. Book, well, we booked it and changed that. So we drove in two days. Nice. Oh, wow. You took a two-day drive here. That's incredible. Well, thanks and welcome to Colorado, first of all. Um, and it, yeah, you did. You were planning on coming to Marijuana Madness. You had purchased your tickets, and uh, we had to cancel it. Um, and I, I felt really bad about that. You know, first of all, I mean, um, but a lot of people were very upset about that. And we will, you know, it's gonna. We'll, we'll, we're going to do this event. We're just going to reassess how we're going to do the event, and if we want to do it in Denver, which most likely it's not going to happen. Um, and then we'll just find another place. It's just a bummer because I really want to do it Hood Lab because it's a great space. And uh, Adam Dunn, who um, owns Hood Lab uh, with his wife Cece, our, uh, our part oh, of yeah, our cannabis a family. Denver's it's a, terrible. Denver's yeah, on a tear you know, today, by the way. They're, they have their public health and environment people coming in. They're, uh, it's, it's not um, – I don't think what they're doing is uh, – <clears throat> I don't think legal is the right turn. Uh, I think they are um, superseding proper due process, due process. So usually, like, when they in have... In what realm are you talking about? Well, that? basically, they're coming into people's, like, uh, MIPS and saying that the MIPS are all now, in Denver, are now all regulated under um, their health and environment, and they're all regulated like food. So you have to do all these food handling standards and procedures with your hash oil, which is, like... Which I think would be fine if people had had proper notice that this is how we're going to be regulating you now. So usually you just tell people, okay, by you know, there's usually a due process. There's usually a public hearing. Absolutely. There's usually some testimony. You know, this is how we do it. There's then you know then it's uh this is how what you need. Then you know this then the city or the regulators let you know, okay, this is how we're going to be coming in and regulating you. You have X amount of time to comply, and then you comply, and then they come in and inspect and make sure you're complying. But they skipped that step. They skipped the that first step and now they're just coming they're just letting people know by the way you're going to be in in a day or two and if you're not complying we're going to shut you down which is not so they've been going into people's places today well my understanding was though that the mips generally were already um trying to keep up with good food safety standards were they not so like i mean weren't they for the medical license didn't they have to have their kitchens inspected as like a proper commercial kitchen that's yeah for mips like if you're doing food if you're doing edibles like this was never. Oh, not really, just for concentrates. This is concentrates now. This is not. This is. 
It's going beyond edibles into concentrates. This is just so the city of Denver. It's just yes, the city, city of Denver. Of Denver. So, Den- I mean, Denver is, it's amazing to me because, like, and, 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 I want to bring in why you, one of the reasons why you guys are here. Marijuana Madness was was one of the events you were coming to, and it was canceled. And part of what's happening here is it, it seems like Denver, which was at one point seemed very progressive as a city by decriminalizing it the level they did before uh, on cannabis, but now that we've legalized in Amendment 64, they're like really like trying to knuckle down and be really like, you know, dick. Like, what's the best way to put it? It's like dick bags. Dick bags. Yeah, dick okay. bags. I'll take dick bags. Dick bags. Um, and you it's were like, going to say like dictatorship. But I was going to say dictatorship, just... but they're really just dick bags. Dick bags. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it's like, and it's not like the people in the industry, we, we don't, we want to be legal, but it's like, okay, well, if something doesn't exist to have an event or something, then let's like create some kind of temporary thing and let us like work it out and make it a good like. Well, like, even a funny thing with these events was that, so for example, there was always um, AJ Hashman always did the patient MMJ meet and greets. Yeah. Oh, he's done for years. He's had a collaborative, not as a collaborative relationship with the Denver Police Department, but he would... Uh, they he, communicated. They communicated, and he would say, um, this is what we're doing. We're just letting you know. Um, we're having this event, and it's red card patient only. This mm-hmm. is before adult use marijuana was passed. And in all these, in four years, I think he's been doing this. Yeah. Um, and they've, they've never, never had, had a problem. problem. Never, ever had a problem. Ever. And now they're suddenly coming in saying you can't have these events anymore. And not even that they're going after the people with the events that are throwing the events. They're going after the venues that are hosting the events, saying that, like, this is a violation of your business license and things like that. Um, I don't happen to agree with that. It's just sort of one of those situations, though, where you can sue and win, like they did in Colorado Springs with the whole... Well, they won on the planning commission like in that that part of it right well, but they still could be like the city they, council could still come down on right you, well, you the city council, then they well what you have to say is like you can't sit there and say like if there's no like zoning or if there's nothing allowed like right. so if something's not like prohibited or prescriptive right. like you, you can't say like you can't if something says you cannot do this and then you do it then you're violating there's nothing that says you cannot do this or that you can do this so if it's like this shade of gray and so they've well, always operated in the shade of gray and like, you know, and, and so, I mean, it's just a matter of finding the right, uh, sorry, my band-aids are falling. If I have major blisters, I need to walk to lunch today for like 20 blocks. I'm sorry. My band-aid is falling off. I okay. Well, it. <laughs> it was distracting. So first of all, just to refer the, the, the place you were talking about referring to in Colorado Springs was, um, uh, Studio 64, uh-huh. Casey Stark. Yeah. Um, and they were saying it was a zoning issue. Yeah. And they went after that and he fought, and, you know, and, and they could this, you know, they could always appeal and fight him again. Yeah. But so far they've won that battle, the, which is yeah, great. Yeah, so the key is coming up with the right key. Like anyone who I guess gets shut down could probably sue the city or fight it. It's just a matter of saying right. you got to find the right uh, you got to find the right case. It's always the, supposed to be the right case. The real irony of this whole thing, though, is Colorado Springs it is the second largest cannabis market in, in Colorado. Mm-hmm. But it also has, like, the least progressive, like, city council or city government um, when it comes to cannabis. And yet they have been allowing these clubs in Colorado Springs. There's actually, like, four, I think, right now, you know, down in Colorado well, it's not Springs. So much, yeah, it's not so much as, like, a progressive conservative. I think they're... A little bit more libertarian ish. Yeah, that's you would a good think. way to like, put it. Yeah, and, and so there's just Colorado Springs. But yet in Denver, which is supposed to be considered the mo- most progressive city, um, you know, it seems like th- they're just coming down on any event like this. And, it, and it's just amazing yeah, to me. Yeah, I like the, to the, call it backdoor banning, backdoor prohibition. Yeah. Get but things like this, you know, yeah. they, it stimulates the economy. I mean, we had food trucks that were going to be there. That was going to help those business people. Then you have other people that are like teaching about their businesses. And then you, this was a talent search. This was a talent search, so some people could have like really gained out of yeah. out of this uh, event. Well, so it's I, really upsetting. Um, I feel eventually these we're, there's going to be something done on a level in Denver that allows for private clubs or allows for some kind of zoning or licensing for yeah. people to go and enjoy their cannabis because you can't exactly tell people like tourists like you can't smoke in public, you can't go to these hotels. Like, there's very, 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 very few hotels that are, like, cannabis-friendly. Well, and they're on the down low, I'm sure. That was the big thing for me, because when I wrote to um, the lawyer for excise and licensing, um, and it was a different lawyer that responded, but it was, like, four days later. So I definitely know they had a conversation about this. They worked it out to, like, write what letter they did. And the basic, and what I asked them was define uh, private consumption and public consumption. 
You know, just define what public consumption is. Because to me, and I'm pretty sure it's the city, public consumption for alcohol is like drinking in the streets. Yes. You know, so that's public consumption. Um, so why is it different for cannabis right now? That, and that, that, that's the question I have. And, you know, and I get that they want to have a license maybe created on this, or maybe they don't even want to create the license because they don't want to open up that. Um, but uh, they should, you know, because it's, it's revenue for the city. Yeah. And, and then we have, you know, two gentlemen here who drove two days from Tennessee to come up here. You guys here. drove? Yeah. yeah and they truck, did. trailer, Winnebago. Little Subaru. Little Subaru. Little Subaru. Oh, you hippies. <laughs> in, our, in our own bald way. <laughs> <laughs> And um, and they you know they drove up here for this and they, and they're coming here and they're gonna they can purchase cannabis legally here but there's nowhere for them to smoke unless they find some people which of course you guys can have but you know I mean where you you know are able to have somewhere to they'll provide for well you to I think it's just ridiculous that like you can smoke in a private home but you can't smoke in a private business even if it's like um, even if it's like not viewable from a public right away like it's just it's just crazy to me. Mm-hmm. That, like, I, so, oh, it's okay in my house, but if I own my own business and I own the property, yep. that I don't, I, it, just because it's like it's zoned for a business and not for, like, residential is ridiculous. It's crazy. That's the thing that got me about this whole situation is if you're, if you're wanting people to visit, if it's legal, if everything like that's going on, where are we supposed to go? Well, they don't I want mean, really, people to where, visit where, for this. Where, where they are hate we, that. Really, where they are hate we it. supposed to go? And I they mean, and you it. don't want, and the thing I understand about the, all of it is they don't want anybody under 21 to have it or anything. And I agree with all that. I mean, I'm not trying to cause a problem. I'm happy to have it legal. But, you know, if somebody could just, you know, just tell the people coming in, okay, there's a place out next to the airport. Yeah. You know, or something like that to where you feel like, you know, you're not going to be, because you can't drive around and do it. I mean, I would get to the point. I just think it, I would, uh, to me, I would just throw the party anyways. Not that I would ever want to put David or Adam in, like, any kind of, like, legal jeopardy. But I would have thrown the party anyways. And I would have, like, just said, I dare you. I dare you to come write everyone here tickets. Well, come after their license. It, it, it just wouldn't work that way the, because there was a threat. All right? There was a threat. The livelihood. Yeah, so to his the license, livelihood right? of to, to, to not, not Adam's license. The other yeah. cannabis industry businesses that were going to be sponsoring us to help make the event possible, and any of them, there the threat, and I think it was an unwarranted threat, but it was enough for all of them because that's how everybody has to be in this industry, where they they very rarely are able to say, well, I know that that's not going to be right because they're you know they can't just do that. Um, they just would rather not be bothered because they're constantly being you know regulated and pushed down on this. Now I get those regulations need to happen, but like the way it's being enacted is ridiculous. No, oh, it's ridiculous. But I mean, like eventually you have, somebody's got to draw a line in the sand and say to Denver City and County, like, I dare you to come after people's licenses. This is not a violation of it's, their license. It's too delicate. To sponsor an event. I know, but eventually you have to... I'm saying, I know you're saying it's delicate. I understand it's delicate. What I'm saying is eventually somebody's going to have to in order to enact change because they're not going to do it. You got to, like, call... It's almost like calling someone's bluff. Right. Speaking of... Uh, speaking of what? Speaking calling of... Calling a bluff? Yes. Yeah, so yesterday, um, they... There was a bill in the Colorado State Senate in the Colorado State Legislature, mm-hmm. to raise the tobacco age to 21, to keep it in line with the alcohol and marijuana, and it died yesterday in committee. Of course it did. And then guess, guess who voted uh, no against this bill? Who? Frank McNulty, the guy who's bringing up the edible bands to save the children, Right. So, but I mean, can you explain to that me, to it's me? a freedom thing, though. I mean, if you're 18 years old, you should be considered an adult. I actually think the drinking age should be 18 as well, and I think the cannabis oh. age should be 18. Uh, you know, I mean, if you can die for your country at 18, right. you should be able to have a drink right, and why? toast your your fellow. Oh, vets there was or, plenty you know, of Republicans who gave that argument. Don't get me wrong, because it was the Republicans who kill it. You know, because Democrats were all about saving people's lives and like health and protecting if children. You can, if you can go to jail as an adult, you should be able to do everything oh, that any other adult. Can I do. agree 100. percent But what I'm saying saying is like don't you think it's rather ironic that the people who support banning edibles and like want to regulate of marijuana course. because it we got to save the children that's they always say what about what the, gra- some, the grace won't, moment won't someone think of the babies yeah well the it's just the, the, the big thing is do you want your government to legislate how you raise your children or do you want to leave it up to the parents 
You know, that that's the you know, that's what it is on that at argument. It always drives me crazy when they're like, Oh well, we have to do this for the kids. It's like, no, just educate your kids you know as that, a parent. That bill's coming back to yeah. the drug endangered child definition. Yeah. So we actually we have to take a break. Do we even take any breaks last we week? We do. We yeah. didn't. Well you didn't? No, oh, it was awesome. Bad, bad, bad. So um we have a, we have a new sponsor. And I, I just want to talk about them because I'm really excited to have them as a sponsor because they're actually my favorite edible company. Um, I know I'm not supposed to say that and be unbiased as a. Uh, You're as supposed a, to be unbiased. I well. Because you throw parties all the time where people give you their swag and you have to taste it and test it. That yeah, is one of the that things would be I nice do. if you that did that. That is one of the things I do. What is the Edibles Company? Uh, Incredibles, uh, medically correct actually. Ah. So, so the, and you know, there's some new things from Incredibles. They have this new um, Makiba bar. Is there a very special version of like a superfood granola bar? Um, it is packed with 20 different nuts and seeds. Do they make it with hemp? Um, it does have hemp in it, I believe. Yes, ah. it, you know it's got protein, 30 milligrams of THC of THC mixed in with uh, an extra 10 milligrams of pure CBD oil. So this is like the bar for anybody who wants to embody the Colorado Mo- Rocky Mountain High Spirit. Um, it is more powerful than it sounds because I have tried it myself. Um, so Makiba is my kind of bar. I mean, it is. Like a superhero I, bar? It's like a superhero bar. I mean, seriously. So here's what I want to say about it. Because I, before they, like, launched the Makiba bar, I was I happened to go in Incredibles office. And uh, my friends over there, Rick, gave me um, gave me a Makiba bar that was, like, a test product. They hadn't quite, you know, they hadn't launched it yet or anything. So he bribed I, you. It's cool. No, he didn't. He, no, no. It was a sample because he wanted my opinion on something. And we were going to be reviewing the bar. So it's part of, like, I'm just you teasing. Know, go on. Um... But um, it's it, it was amazing. It was amazing because it was um, probably the best actual experience I've ever had on an edible. Because you have this nice THC balance, but the CBD is kind of counteractive, so you're actually more alert throughout the day. And it had a great mood elevation like feeling, you know, to the point where I actually had the best mood I was in for like months because it was like a super stressful day. But I was like didn't care about it. It was like I still felt good. I made a handful of them. No but yeah, I mean, seriously. So, I, but like they make a lot of other great products. But you know, I, that's why I'm just very excited. Um, this is my way of pitching them right now for them. But I am really excited because they are one of the best companies out there, and uh, they're sponsors for us. So, really proud to have Incredibles as part of our family here at I Cannabis. Um, and so, I think uh, we can get back to uh, talking with you guys because before we go to uh, Matt McLean in the next 15 minutes. Um, I want to talk about um, your experience with um, making your own Rick Simpson oil, yeah. um, Appalachian Man. Um, so uh, could you tell us a little bit about like Wait, how that, that came about? Is that the break's over? That was the break. That was the break? Yeah, that was me pu- plugging the Incredibles. You did like 1950 style. I did it like 1950s style because I just got the like the script, so I had to like kind of free form it. But uh, and give my honest opinion, Incredibles, because oh, that was me doing it. Oh, okay, sorry. See, that's how we do here, all right? Where we just kind of roll with it. We roll with it. Oh. I I just I got the script like two minutes before the show started. No. So that was yeah. See that that's mm-hmm. how that's professionalism right there. Two minutes before a show starts is professional. No, no, I did. Oh. I got it two minutes before the show started. I only looked I'm at just it. Keeping up. Yeah, oh, yeah. Here, here you are keeping up. All right, so Appalachian man. I'm sorry. Let's get back to this. So you're from Tennessee. Yeah. You've you had um, a specific ailment. I don't know if you want to share about it, but you're, you're welcome to. Uh, I think I it's interesting, by the way, because I hadn't heard a story like this before. Well, I never thought about it until I started hearing how it helped muscle. Mm-hmm. And I had followed Rick Simpson, heard about it, stuff like that. But then uh, I got a phone call from my cardiologist. He did a test on me. And he t- basically told me I had six months. Six to months? To live? Yeah. And he told me I had six months. So he sat there and said, we need to do this surgery called... Uh, and uh, what, what did am- he say was wrong with your heart? Well, he says it's so damaged. My arteries are supposedly like 110 years old okay okay i'm 52 okay Okay. this was like seven years eight years back Mm -hmm. so i'm sitting here and i'm like going okay i'm too young to have all this problem sure and what happened was is when back in the 80s i had spinal meningitis in my 20s which is something that adults usually don't live through right so it's devastating on your body right and it and what they did and what they do just like chemotherapy is they mega dose you they put so much medicine into Mm -hmm. you that it either kills you or kills it. Well, what it was is it was basically I had during that time over, like, I think it was 89 spinal taps. Wow. So by doing that, that was the whole thing that really got me is 
I'm damaged. Sure. I mean, I'm sure. damaged from this point on. Sure. But I kept on trying to go to work. I kept on trying to do things, feeling like hell all the time. Right. And um, then we bang up to where we're, you know, I'm, I'm out in a baseball field. My daughter's being a cheerleader for the local football team. And the uh, doctor says, uh, you won't sit down. And I'm like, not really. I don't take nothing sitting down. Right. So let's do this. What we got to do? Tell me what I have to do. I'll meet you 100%. He said, I can't tell you you got more than six months. And he says, and the thing I want to do is I want to do this amblation, which is a, it's a where they burn parts of your heart from the inside to get your beat. My, my, my heart beats erratically. Okay. And from the damage. Okay. Okay. So it beats on its own beat. Right. And it sounds like. I can't put a sound to it. Right, right. But I can be sitting here talking to y'all right now, and not because of adrenaline or anything like that. My heart just start going it just crazy. Start beating up. Crazy, crazy beats. Gotcha. And gotcha. I mean, and it'll make me go flush. Right. I could pass out. Right. Okay, so they got in there. They supposedly did several thousand shocks in my heart and burns in my heart. Wow. And said, okay, you'll be fine. We got the heartbeat beating where it needs to be. Okay. Everything's fine. My mom and dad's at the end of the at the end of the. Uh, the bed when I right. come out, you know, right. and they're checking me out. Right. And uh doctor says, fine. In less than two weeks, my heart come back to the original beat. Wow. So he's sitting there going, I don't know what to do. Okay. So then I start finding this stuff out about Rick Simpson, how, how, how it helps everything. It helps anything. I had not heard about heart damage, by the way. Had no, you? I hadn't heard anything about I've never about heard any. Damage. This is and, really and the, the first thing, time I've heard about heart and, damage. And the thing that got me was, is it was like, okay, what can I do? So my mother, when I was younger, got me a medical book from the turn of the century mm-hmm. for like 10 bucks. Right, right. And a garage sale item, basically. Wow. Inside of it, it has how the herbs were used back in our past. Sure. And under it was Indian hemp. Right. Yeah. That's so, you know, so that got my wheels turning on following this. You know, I never looked at it as I'm getting stoned. Of course. It helps me. I chill out. I don't get mad at people half as mm-hmm. much. Mm-hmm. If I ain't got it, I get mad at people a lot. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. I mean, you know, and, it, and you sit there. I don't like the pills they give me. I don't like all the stuff. It's got so many side effects, all this other stuff. Right. So the doctor tells me, do what you want to do, but please try to keep it restrained. Right. So I'm sitting there and I'm saying, well, I can't drink. And right. I wasn't a big drinker anyways. Right. But, you know, what can I do with this? This is one thing I believe in. So I started checking out, started corresponding with Rick Simpson through Facebook. Cool. And we started corresponding with each other. And, and How long ago was this now? This was Oh, this ago? has been, well, th- this was right before his place got raided in Nova Scotia, which I want to say is like seven years ago. Uh, something like that. Seven, yeah. eight yeah. years ago. And... I was getting ready to go to Rick Simpson's house. We were talking about going wow. to go see Rick Simpson. You know, if, if this man could show me how to do it. It's amazing. We wouldn't even known about him without YouTube. Yeah. Right. So YouTube was like the teacher. So so he kind of helped you in like how to how to make it. Yeah. Well, like, he told he told me make sure you check it all. Do it outdoors. Don't do nothing indoors. Right, it, right. You know, you got alcohol vapor yep. going on. Yep. Don't, and yeah. and so I sit there and he said, and what you need to look at. You know, they tell you get the best bud you can get. Right. When you're up in the mountains and there's not a lot of bud, you got to get what you can, well, what yeah. you can get. Well, so but, I yeah. was using what you can get is the best you can get. I was so. getting stems. I was getting right. leaves from other people that was in like this small little group of people right. I knew, and they gave them to they gave it to me. If this could help here, take it. We can't sure. do nothing with it. How much were you taking a day? I was taking well when it first started out. It was just like Tommy Chong. I was sleeping. Because I was using something about the size of a piece of double lot shot. Sure. So that's a big, pretty big ball. Okay. Okay, so after I backed it down and backed it down and backed it down, about the size of a grain of rice, four times a day, that does it. Wow. And you sit there and you do that, a little bit of hot coffee, hot tea. It all goes through the, the mucosa in the mouth. Uh-huh. You don't have to even swallow it. Um, and the How way long it, before you started seeing effects? Besides the I, relief. I felt the, the effects that first night. Now, did your heartbeat start to beat more regularly? It still beats its own way, but the anxiety level and the stress level that it used to do when it came on. And, and, this, came is, on. and this is a combination of THC and CBD? 
At that time, nobody or talked about nobody CBD. Talked nobody, nobody talked about it. Talked so about you don't know what you so, I mean, there was CBD, so, but probably not as much as, right, you know, right. now. This yeah. is just marijuana extract. At this, right. point. At this point, it's as, it's as clean as I can make, you know, when they say you're using trash. So you're using stems and everything everybody throws away. Well, you know, the old way, see, I make tinctures now. So, you know, I've got the tinctures working with me. You know, I get the old and I sit there and I get, you know, just basically like Keith and stuff like that. And then I'll make tinctures out of that with Everclear. Well, the, I'm using the same thing. And like I was saying, Jenny, Jennifer, that used to have the show on here, mm-hmm. talked about where you needed to change, get rid of NAFTA and go to food quality. Mm-hmm. That's when this whole thing changed. I noticed the quality change. I noticed that it was didn't you didn't make you feel sluggish. That was the one thing I didn't like about it. When you first took the oil, you felt just a little sluggish. Sure, sure. But and, you develop a resistance, I mean, to that part of it, right? And then you, you know. Yeah, you well, can, you could, it's the thing that got me was is you could taste the difference. Right. That's the it, okay. it had like a twang, like a metal twang. Interesting. And but then the food quality, no twang at all. Just cleaner. All, uh, yeah, a lot yeah, cleaner. I got gotcha. you. A lot cleaner. I got gotcha. you. So um, when you went back to the doctor, what did he say? Well, I went back this past July. Mm-hmm. Uh, when this whole process started, my heart was only doing like 20, 26% mm-hmm. of the muscle And this time. was after how many, how long? That was at the first. That was at the first before the emblation. Okay. 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 Now, as of July... I'm now at something like 57%. Wow. They never expected it to get that good. They never. And he says, now, you know, your heart's beating where, in, within normal parameters for a 52-year-old overweight guy. Right. But, I mean, still, I, I think it's wonderful. I mean, I, my wife is tickled to death. My daughter is ecstatic. You know, I'm, I've lived longer than they gave me any kind of credit. You know, my brother's been right by my side, right like my wife. He's had three different death dates out leaving them all. Now they're trying to get him to get a job. <laughs> <laughs> they said, you're disabled. You can't do this. I said, man, just get I, If I got to get a job, I got to get it in Colorado. Right. If I'm giving up disability, I've right. got to have people. And if I had my way, well, I'd I would work think you'd still be able to be on disability if your heart's only at 52. percent Well, though. they right. say that, well, but that's the way they. I mean, they really they're messing with me in a bad is way. That a is, state state, is that a state to state? Is that a state to state thing, or is that? The biggest yeah. thing that's, is what, I'm, that's what I'm hoping. If I come here, I mean, right? They don't want to hear that. They, they yeah. Not my doctor, yet. when I start doing that. Uh, you're having diabetes problems. That's a problem. You're just you're not. You're well, not. But you I'm guys have a good. Canvas. You guys have a great representative in, in Tennessee, though, in um, Steve Cohen. S- Steve Cohen, yeah, yeah, he really is. I mean, we were actually talking about it. You said that he went after a DEA agent. Um, yeah. Just today. No, it was yesterday. this past. It was this past Friday. Okay. Um, he, I mean, and it's on YouTube blowing up. And when you go look at it, I mean, he tells them, you know, this is an slinger. This, and he educates, right. he starts giving them the history. Right. And, you know, and he, well, if you, he, and the guy from the DEA kept on saying, it's Schedule 1. You know, it's just like, you don't see no difference. No, it's Schedule 1. And when you start seeing that, it's like, you know, they are paid not to change their mind. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. they're paid to change their mind. Well, they're also saying it's Schedule, I mean, you can keep saying it's Schedule 1. I'm just, you know following the law yeah. as I'm supposed to do as a DEA agent because it's really up to uh, Congress to change that. I mean, right. the president kind of, I mean, he could. I mean, and Eric Holder's done what he's done. But, you know, it would be better if Congress just goes ahead and changes it. You know, and I, I think it's going to happen. I think Sanjay Gupta's second piece really pushes it. I think it's going to get to that point. Piece. I think you're going to yeah. see it after the midterms. I agree. Now, I, I have to, now I have to say through. that Harry Smith did a real good job yeah. for C, CNBC. Mm-hmm. He did a really good job. So I mean, you know, I mean, you've got to. He promoted. He promoted uh, Colorado really well. Right on. Well, listen, guys. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, we got to go to another word from our sponsor that I'm going to kind of wing again, <laughs> um, and then we're going to be oh, getting on the phone. 1950 style. Yeah, we're going to be getting on the phone with uh, Matt McLean. You want to do it? Yeah. Give okay, me the but you haven't even read it yet. It's it doesn't right, matter. It's right there. All right. So here you go. Ready. You pulled the mic again. I just seen you. <laughs> Whatever. They never did this in the 1950s, by the way. Also new from Incredibles, Gum Ease. Our new gummies will come in a two-pack. Each two-pack will contain 100 milligrams of the finest medicine around. What's more, each 50 milligram infused gummy will be fortified with 100 milligrams of vitamin C for extra healthful kick. Available in black cherry, green apple grape, orange, strawberry, blue raspberry, and strawberry banana. 
Gummies, new from Incredibles, and some same great flavors, brand new shape, and now fortified with vitamin C. Remember to look for all your favorite flavored Incredible bars at your local dispensary. Boulder bars, monkey bars, blueberry crisp bars, strawberry cough crunch bars, peach dream bars, peanut butter but- Buddha bars, and the famous mile high, mile higher bars. Ask, them, ask for them by name and have an Incredibles day. Yeah? That was all right. That was all right. I, I, you know, I, I thought you were going to do like a 1950s voice. I didn't know so. how to do a 1950s voice I, I, all of a sudden. Sure. I like sort of been hanging out with the southern guys and I had a little twang it up. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah? What's, a, what's, a, what's a 1950s voice? What would a 1950s voice be? You'd be talking like this, you know? You're like, oh, hey, no. hi, can I, is Matt there? <laughs> <laughs> Matt, hey, how you doing? It's Dave from the Hemp Connoisseur Radio. How are you today? Doing great, Dave. Yourself? Um, excellent. So um, this is Matt McLean. Um, I don't know if you got to hear your intro earlier today. Earlier, I don't know if you've been listening to the show. Um, uh, I did. No. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. No Matt, worries. I see your I see your sponsored Facebook posts all the time. I always see people liking Hemp Recreator all yeah. the time on Facebook. So that's Samantha Walsh, who Hi. is uh, one of the principal lobbyists here for the cannabis industry in Colorado, and my co-host. Particularly hemp. Particularly hemp. So she's very interested. Always in taking on new clients, here. Matt. Always taking on new clients. <laughs> oh, look at her. She's trying to sell you on the radio right now on her. Uh, <laughs> Um, so can you tell us a little bit about Recreator um, uh, to our listeners? Yeah, of course. Uh, we're based out of Los Angeles. We've kind of come together over the summer here. Um, and we've been working hard for a couple years to get this concept, uh, you know, get our feet on the ground and really get it going. Uh, right now we got a Kickstarter campaign going. We only have seven days left. Uh, you know, we've hit our $25,000 goal, but we're, we're going to push further on and, uh, actually signed some new artists and we'll be releasing some new designs as well um so do you do great things oh i'm sorry finish please. well i was going to ask you do you do with the artists do you do like limited edition t-shirts or are you like are they can continually be reprinted right so we kind of have two models with this we have you know what you would call like a base model uh which is a more affordable hemp t-shirt that's 30 percent hemp 70 percent organic cotton and then we have a hundred percent hemp t-shirt as well and with the artists, we try and give them both options. If they want to submit a design um, for, like, a large-scale production, they can do that. But we also do one-offs. We do uh, collector pieces. And that's, that's something we're going to be really getting into over the summer when we uh, start to drop these new designs uh, and really expand our product line. Nice. So is, uh, are all products going to have um, hemp in them, or are you looking at outsourcing to other, like, eco-textiles? Uh, we're focused on hemp. Uh, we think it's the best fiber on earth, and we're going to stick with it. Right on. Um, we are doing some blends with that as well, with some recycled poly, uh, organic cotton. Um, we're working on some different treatments, but the focus is really hemp. And so every every product, whether it's a snapback or a sweatshirt, it's going to have hemp in it. Right on. Now, I know that you have to source your hemp from um, countries like China, I'm assuming, um, for right now. But uh, I also know your goal is to start uh, utilizing um, hemp being milled here in America, correct? Yeah, of course. So we've got this model that we're kind of throwing out there called Seed to Stitch. Um, and actually, a, a great inspiration for that was when we were able to come to uh, Ryan Laughlin's hemp harvest this past fall. We drove from L.A. 18 hours, um, showed up on his farm in Springfield, met him and his family, uh, spent a couple of days there, got some good chow, and got to walk through the hemp fields and actually pull them up by the hand. So, um, you know, having that firsthand experience and then coming back here and realizing, yes, we have to continue to import the fabric, uh, you know, it, it's kind of... Uh, it's kind of surprising at this stage in the game, especially since medicinals push so far here in California, and mm-hmm. you, know, you all are growing hemp in Colorado. So, uh, how close is Cal- California? Is not on the list of states that have like said they were going to grow hemp, or, well, are they? They have an industrial hemp bill that just passed. Mm-hmm. Um, now, whether or not hemp gets grown in California is a an issue. They have such a vibrant outdoor growing market for just marijuana. That you're, you're dealing with cross-pollination. You're dealing then, with yeah. pollen drift, and, <laughs> and that's such an, inter- an entrenched industry. Sure, uh, sure. I think it would I, – I, I, I just imagine that it's going to be Can you go battle. seven to eight miles in agricultural I'm, land without – I mean, I would think a, you could. But. A marijuana field. I don't right. know, maybe. Uh, but they're, they're, yeah. they're running into the same problem we gotcha. are, which is seed importation and um, – 
things like that. But it, you should grow it in Colorado or Kentucky, actually. I've always said Kentucky would be better to grow for fiber because it's going to be able to grow taller in Kentucky because they have more rainwater than uh, than we in California have. Sure. But um, Yeah, we've actually we've been in communication with the uh, Kentucky Hemp Growers Co-op. Um, you know, we've got some people. It's funny, since we started this Kickstarter campaign, we, we get all kinds of requests including, uh, hey, can you provide seed or land or, you know, some farmers in Colorado that could help us grow. Um, you know, w- m- the majority of our crew is from Indiana, mm-hmm. and so there's a lot of moves being made there now, which is quite interesting. Um, so you might be moving back to Indiana. <laughs> <laughs> that would be funny to right. move, uh, you know, to move production uh, back to a state not quite known for textiles at this right. point, but... You know, obviously, in, in the end game, you know, we're right down the street from American Apparel. So, um, you know, we're looking for a vertically integrated model, uh, you know, somewhere we could have hemp house and hemp fuel, uh, growing the fiber on the land, working with farmers and, uh, you know, doing the writing or decorticating right there and producing the fiber and fabric here in the U.S. Right on, right on. So, is uh, are you guys doing a lot of advocacy as well? Um, and and what like are you going to take some of that money and kind of put towards promotion of hemp, or most of that going to be invested right back into the company to help you guys grow? Right. I mean, kind of the way we look at it is our marketing campaign is majorly a reeducation on hemp. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, some of our our base market and some of our core friends and family are from the Midwest, from Florida, from back east. So. Uh, even with them, it's funny trying to, I guess, re-educate, you know, people asking if, if they're going to get in trouble for wearing their shirt in Georgia or, right. you know, <laughs> so do I need to get to a front address to ship right. it? You know? Can I so, smoke my shirt? <laughs> right. Can I smoke my shirt? Yeah, we get that. We actually put it on the tag. No, you can't smoke the shirt. So yeah, right exactly. Now. You have to because people keep asking that question. Are you, yeah. are you guys looking to yeah. do anything in Colorado specific or you're going to be mostly headquartered in California? Uh, you know, it's funny because I think we're we're living in somewhat prophetic times where we have, uh, I'm a big uh, Ayn Rand fan and, and Red Atlas Shrugged, and it's kind of like all these industries break down and then they go and they become headquartered in some sort of like Shambhala oasis in Colorado, and that could quite possibly be the hemp industry that's growing up right now. So um, we're like you know, the Mecca. Want... Go, to, go ahead. Are we the Mecca then? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I'm really hoping SoCal kind of steps up to the plate as well. But, right. you know, we've got a lot of good friends in Colorado, whether it's Tim Hoodlam and uh, Ryan Laughlin or, or Jason Love and uh, Morris Beagle who's putting on the NoCo Hemp Expo. I'm speaking um, yeah, So like Robert Takata. So these are, these are all guys that have really, you know, helped educate us and lead the way and, and set a great model. Um, we're just trying to really see what we can do and, uh, we know LA is a great market if we can kind of turn some heads and uh, first is you know becoming a fashionable brand. Well, I've got some uh, tax credits for you if you're interested. Do you know? I'm not, <laughs> not that I'm like trying to bribe she, you to come to Colorado. But. Yeah, but she kind of is because she wants everybody to move to Colorado who has a good business idea. Hey, That's, hey, you know, hey, yeah. and, and I'm and I'm honestly with her. We're a little biased because we're out here, but you know, I mean, to me with hemp, it's like there's going to be hemp's going to be everywhere. You know, and good companies are going to be able to merge all over this country because of the nature of what hemp is. And uh, and I, you know, if you guys stay in Southern Cal, you're going to do just fine out there too. I have a pretty good feeling. I know. I guess I have a sort of like I would love like every major hemp brand to be just like headquartered in Colorado. Like you've uh-huh. got hemp hood, hood lambs got. So we're like the Silicon Valley. Yeah, thing. like yeah. they've got their they've got their yeah. flagship store here, but they've now branched out to San Francisco. Right, and, right, right. But that's what I would. And of course. Personal. Yeah, and of course, some of the markets we want to move into would be Denver and Boulder. Uh, you know, we got some good good friends, and also DJ in Denver, the Base Crooks. Uh, you know, they're in a pink house and everything. Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, we got we got a lot of good folks out that way. Um, for us, it's like you know, we live on Gallery Row. We live right near the Fashion District, right. the Arts District, and th- and that's kind of our core focus. So, um, this is where the industry is, and, and until uh, you know, for us, it's really like <laughs> we got to make the product before we can kind of backtrack and and, and go with the farming and, and the processing. And hopefully, within the next year or two, that infrastructure is really going to begin to rebuild. And, sure. I mean, Cal- California is moving forward. Um, you know, hopefully, we get seeds in the ground here in 2014. I, I um, think you will. 
I think you will. What's that? I think, well, not 2014. I would say more like 2015 or 16. Um, yeah, yeah. But, uh, you know, it's it's just, it's going to happen all over the country very soon because, I mean, just on the marijuana side, what people saw in Colorado in the first month, they were all surprised. And I think anybody in this industry was, like, not surprised at all. But outsiders right. were. And it, I think it woke up the entire country as to, like, the benefit. And, hem- and once that happened, I mean, the way that happened, and everyone's like, oh, well, now we're looking at legalizing marijuana. It's like, well, why the hell wouldn't we, like, start mass producing hemp? Yeah. You know? Right, and I, I think it's really part of a larger movement of sustainability and, and mm-hmm. having a relationship with the earth. And you know, um, you know, we're kind of pushing forward this urban shamanism, um, and that's part of the reason we're in the belly of the beast here. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and right. hemp's just like you know, it's the best plant. I think there's a Virginia Hemp Coalition um, little infographic going around, and it's just like you know, let's just call it what it is: the best plant on earth. Yep. So yeah, I've seen that. <laughs> And it is, you know, it, it is. It, People don't believe you because it's one of those things that's like it sounds too big, too good to be true sometimes when you tell them all the great things that hemp does. It's like they you almost see a glaze go over their eyes. And it's like, no, it, it can't do all those things. But it does. Tell me more about this urban shamanism. I, I want to know what that is. <laughs> I love It's a great buzzword. I want to use it. Urban shamanism. Yeah, okay. yeah. He I mean, said it. It usually catches people's ears. Uh you know, it, it's it's funny because I'm doing a, a PhD in, in mythological studies right now and depth psychology. So, um, one of the core reasons I'm into this is obviously because of the sustainability, mm-hmm. uh, because of the of the, how it can kind of change the tide. But the important thing is, uh, you know, this is <laughs> you got it, it. You got to get to the people who need it most. You know, and we're right off Skid Row here, and so. Even if it's something as simple as like a hemp T-shirt is antimicrobial, mm-hmm. you know, to help prevent staph infection, um, and it has all these other uh, great attributes to it, and just kind of like if we can provide uh, some homeless with a hemp T-shirt, like it starts as simple as there, um, and, and it's just more of a holistic model, um, not getting trapped in, in like a materialistic mindset, right. and you know, right. uh, seeing where it leads, really. Right on. Um, so what's next um, now? Are you guys ever going to be looking at doing like some more? Because um, I love the altruism side of it. But have you guys looked at doing some more like formal wear down the line? Like something more like higher fashion? Because there's everybody. I mean, so many of us and, I, and we're doing the same thing. We're like we, we work on hemp T-shirts because it's obviously the easiest uh, way to get like hemp products out there. But uh, I think what's lacking, I've always I ask everybody in the clothing industry on the hemp side, like, when can I get a hemp suit? <laughs> yeah, of course. And, and that's really why we're focused, uh, you know, on being in Southern California. Mm-hmm. This is the hotbed of the fashion and textile industry, uh, as far as I'm concerned, stateside. Um, you know, we're starting with the T-shirts. I think the 100% hemp T-shirt is something that's really pushing the boundaries and, uh, you know, smooth as silk. Uh, is it really? I, have, I haven't seen 100% in a long time. Last one was kind of rough. I was going to ask you about that. So it is. It's really smooth, huh? Yeah, it's smooth. It's lightweight. Drapes about the body. Um, so that's kind of where we're starting. And we're really, you know, an active lifestyle brand, and we're modeling after streetwear. Um, so you know how these guys broke in the industry, whether it's the Hundreds, Supreme, Stussy, whatever, uh, is with the T-shirt, and and you'll see more from us in the summer and fall. Uh, you know, we're going to be dropping sweats and hoodies and snapbacks. Now, can, um, can we do a, a, a custom, like, if I were to send you, like, a graphic, would you print, like, can I get custom prints? Of course. That's one of the great things about us is we don't do a lot of screen printing. Uh, we're mostly doing digital garment printing. So we print on demand. We don't have a lot of stock, like, just filling up shelves. Um, and that keeps our costs low. And in return, we can kind of... Uh, it's a trade-off for the customer. Um, yeah, we love to do that kind of stuff. We're working. We have eight artists we brought on so far, um, and these are guys kind of working with us on a freelance basis right now. And we're hoping to develop their sublines, um, you know, fall winter. So, you know, we've. That's one of the things. Uh, you know, we're really looking forward to is like, for instance, right now we've teamed up with Morris Beagle and Colorado Hemp Co. Right. And, we're donating three of our 100% black T-shirts with a dual design on it. So it's got his logo on the front, ours on the back. Right on. I um, love your logo, by the way. I love the pine cone logo. 
Thanks, man. Appreciate it. Yeah. That's awesome. It's, yeah. it's very cool. And, it and took a long time. <laughs> you know, you guys did something else that was really unique that I want to, um, I, I just wanted to ask you about. You did, you sent me a link to a YouTube like movie that you guys did. And, um, yeah. And it was really unique, uh, because it was like, it was like one, it, it reminded me of like, yeah, it was like a hemp version of like a Calvin Klein like mini movie where you were kind of like, right. oh, it's a clothing commercial, but it was such a good movie, and and it was like and it it was definitely the the t shirt was like a little bit of a star in it, but it was like very subtle. Right. But I I loved I just loved the actually the cinematography of it. I mean, could you tell me a little bit about that one? Of course, man. Uh, that's actually something we've been working on for quite a while. We started shooting. It's funny because. Um, we started shooting back when um, uh, the government shutdown was happening, and we couldn't get permits, and we wanted to do uh, like a national forest or something. Mm-hmm. So that's what actually took us to Colorado. But when we came back, um, <clears throat> we shot some Big Sur. We shot down here in Malibu. And a great friend of ours, his name's Travis Hoffman. Uh, he's a director of photography, does some high fashion stuff too here in L.A. And then... Uh, uh, the band who scored it, The Good Mad, also good friends of ours. Um, and Ali Gonino is, is the star of the, of the short film as well. Um, so part of what we're trying to do is build this larger culture. And, uh, you know, we, we screened Bringing, Bringing It Home, obviously a great hemp documentary, yeah. in uh, December in Hollywood. Uh, got a great turnout. And so that's part of what we're targeting is that audience. And, and we know that we have to have um, you know, the high production value, we shot it on a red. Um, yeah, we put a lot of time and effort into it. And it's those co- collaborations, like along with the advocacy and the lobbying and uh, and bringing on the artists that really make us a full lifestyle brand. Very cool, very cool. So I, I just want to ask, because so the movie, um, I looked at, you know, when I watched it, I, this was my take on it. I just want to see if you guys were going for something specific. It was like he left like like a technological world and kind of like went back to Mother Nature. Is that kind of what I was looking at? Yeah, yeah. I don't know if you're familiar with the, the like myth we kind of riffed off of, but it's Acteon. And basically what happens is uh, Acteon's a great hunter. He's out on the hunt with all his friends and his dogs, and he stumbles on, uh, you know, like a, a virginal pool and the goddess Diana is sitting there, and, um, you know, like, he takes a look at her when he's not supposed to. She gets mad being the uh, personification or embodiment of nature and respites him, turns him into a stag, and then his own dogs attack him. Well, we're going for the same message, but not in quite uh, a a bloody way. Um, So, yeah, he he leaves the old world and and his old static ways, you know, the, the technological model breaks down. Uh, he gets called into the woods. And, you know, she starts out as Diana, as the siren, um, but then takes him through this liminal realm onto the beach. And it was crazy because we actually had this huge fog uh, rolling into Malibu the day we shot. So it made it much more mystical uh, and mythical. Um, yeah, but it was. Just, you know, taking that further, uh, yeah, and ultimately kind of out into the sea and you know you got you get a you get a vision of the of the goddess kind of uh, Aphrodite or uh, Venus there like a Botticelli's kind of remake so yeah, no, it was very cool. It's very unique. Um, it, it actually was made, made me like be like, wow, I really want to know more about these guys because they're taking a very, you know, I'm, a, I'm also like a film person too because I, I came from that background. So when I see that you're right. integrating, um, you know, doing something like this in, in, in cohesion with your product, uh, I think it's a great idea. It's a good idea for branding. Oh, yeah. Um, so that was actually my favorite uh one of, one of my favorite myths growing up. I used to love the god. Well, Diana, it's and that's the um, Roman, but Greek. It was uh, right. It was our Artemis favorite favorite goddess. Right. She right. hated men. Cool. She killed them all the time. Right. Ha, 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 ha. Sorry. <laughs> like the Amazon, you know. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Um, so well, and, you, go on. Yeah, I'm sorry. and we want to. You know, we're 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 doing both models. So like, when we make a short like that. You know, it's kind of got a softer side to it. And then uh, we just did a, a shoot this last weekend on Skid Row where we, you know, we brought the skaters out and everything. So it's like, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's just a mass marketing for him. Yeah, yeah. 
No, I, um, you know, you know, we get behind that here. So, um, so just so everybody knows, so you can check out um, all of Recreators products and uh, the movie that we're talking about, Acteon. Um, you can go to uh, Recreator dot org. Um, That's and, right. Yeah. yeah. And so, are you guys a nonprofit? We're not. Okay. No, we're an LLC, but the dot org is open, and uh, right you know, we're as much about apparel as we are advocacy. So. Uh, it kind of goes hand in hand. So how did you guys all get together? Uh, it's funny. We're Actually, three of us all went to the same high school in Indiana. Mm-hmm. And then uh, Danny, who's our, one of our founders and our creative director, he and I went to school at Vanderbilt in Nashville, Tennessee as well. In Nashville, Tennessee. Oh, Tennessee in the ah, house. See, we have actually two fans came on for the first half of the show, and they're still here listening in. Um, Appalachian Man and Butch actually drove two days from um, Tennessee to come to Colorado. So they, they've been sitting in on the studio the whole time. Yeah. So how did you like being yeah. out in Tennessee? Oh, I loved it. And that's, you know, that's one of the things. We've actually been quite active since uh, been to the HIA conference in D.C., in November, and mm-hmm. got to meet up with Colleen Salve, uh, who's the director of the Tennessee HIA, mm-hmm. um, and she's kind of leading the way in terms of how to organize on a state level involving that organization, and, um, you know, kind of re-inspired us, and there's, there's the bills moving forward there as well. Uh, it's passed a couple committees, and, you know, part of what we're doing right now is, is kind of trying to get some of our alum and our fellow classmates excited about this, and because we know, you know, whether it's Tennessee, Kentucky, or Indiana, those are all states that have traditionally grown hemp. Um, Indiana is still producing hemp, although it's part of the DEA uh, feral hemp eradication program. Um, so, you know, Tennessee is a beautiful state. It's kind of Athens of the South, and now we're in Athens of the West. So, uh, here we are. <laughs> right on. Well, um, so can you tell us about, like, where you would see a recreator in about 10 years? Yeah, I'm not that, uh, I don't have that foresight. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> where would you like it to be? Where would you like hemp as an industry to be in 10 years? Yeah, I mean, of course, the goal is to have, uh, you know, have it uh, legally grown nationwide, um, Rebuild this infrastructure, whether it's construction or alternative energy or textiles. Um, you know, we're doing pretty good on the food end, although all that stock's coming from Canada mostly. Yeah. Uh, you know, but it'd be great to. Uh, m- my dream's always been this. Just to, you know, I'm from Indiana. Uh, you know, I drive around and see the soy that he's in corn bean, you know, the corn bean ground. Um, I just want to see some hemp fields. <laughs> Do you ever you know, think uh, you'll create like a couture line, like like high fashion? Yeah, yeah, that's why we're here. Um, yeah, we'll definitely have a high fashion line. It's funny. I mean, we're we're kind of at. We even don't have much of a textile background, but um, you know, we're at a real starting point here. We're working with some great folks here in town, um, and and we definitely will. We're gonna get into weldings and within the next year. Um, you know, and really go after it. So, so we got some ideas. I don't want to share them all yet. <laughs> right, right, of course. <laughs> That's right. So where do I go? Like, what website? Like, what's your website? Recreator.org. Um, yeah, of course. I like to let him yeah, get his own right. plug-in, you know, there, David. Okay. Get yeah. your plug-in. <laughs> yeah, well, right now, I mean, for the next week, we're still running this Kickstarter campaign. So it's as simple as going to kickstarter.com, searching Recreator Hemp Apparel. Um, the Action video is on there. Our Kickstarter videos on there and show some footage from Laughlin's Farm, uh, you know, and, and Jason Love and Aguadas and some of these other folks that have been so inspirational uh, in the movement, uh, you know, and most of our stuff's right there. So if you just go to Kickstarter and yeah, we're uploading new blog content daily um, at recreator.org, and uh, pretty soon we're going to be making flipping the switch. Kickstarter's going to go off next Thursday, so only a week left. We go into production, and then we're going to flip on the e-commerce. So, uh, you know, those are the two sites right now where kind of everything is. And, yeah, we pump a lot out on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter as well, so it's not hard to find us. No, definitely awesome. not. So is your e-commerce going to be on recreator.org then? It is, yeah. Right on, right on. Well, thanks for calling in, yeah. and then we're going to uh, let you go so you can go back to, like, you know, changing the world and saving it. <laughs> but Matt McLean. Uh, yeah. Uh, 
Mm-hmm. Exactly. Look for my look for my custom t shirt designs. I've got some ideas I want to send you. Uh, oh. They're Turn mostly them personal. Digs. She's gonna flood you now, man. They're don't, mostly don't personal say, digs at all my friends. You know, yeah. but it's gonna be great. Yeah, because none for you, David. You're not, not my friend. I'm not your friend. No, no. we're not. Friends. Uh, <laughs> so Matt McLean from Recreator. Um, you can check them out at recreator.org or at Kickstarter.com because they just have a few days left. Um, check them out. Um, thanks again for coming on, Matt, and uh, we'll look forward to seeing you guys be real successful in the near future. Thanks a lot. We'll talk soon. All right. Take care. All right, now what? Now we want to talk about. Well, what I want to talk about is um, we've only got like five minutes. Yeah, I know. That's why I, w- I just wanted to say um, that uh, I might not be here next week, uh, and I'm also taking the. You, you know, you have to be here next week, why? no matter what, because I have um, Dr. Paul Bregman coming on. He's going to be talking about some uh, more insight into uh, some medical aspects of cannabis. What happens if I can't meet? I mean, I'm still. Well, you know I'm just saying things. I might not be here because I might be becoming a dad. And oh, so are you on call next I, week? Yeah, it's coming. It's Is it, coming. It's coming next week, really? It's possibly. I'm. We're about a week and a half away, but like, I don't know. I just have that feeling it's going to be early. So uh, eh, it's never early. It's so, always um, for those of late. you out there. Um, if I'm not here, um, I'm either incredibly happy or <laughs> incredibly stressed because it's either before or after. Uh. Um, but uh, I just want to say that. Um, for everybody who is supposed to or planning to go to Marijuana Madness, like my two guests here in the room, I want to personally apologize from the Hemp Connoisseur um, because, you know, we really wanted to have this event for the public. We wanted to have the event to uh, celebrate cannabis freedom. And at this moment, we're not allowed to do it in Denver, but we will reassess it after uh, 420 and possibly do something uh, later on outside of Denver. So we, it's it's not happening right now, but you guys hang tight with us, and we'll probably create something for a little bit later and make sure yeah. we can do it so that we have no worry and everybody can just enjoy themselves. Um, I don't know. I don't have anything else for anybody. Are we getting done early today? No, I'm trying to think of some news. You know, they did this, got the DUI statistics in. They're starting to trickle in from St. Paddy's Day. So who wants to take a guess how many marijuana DUIs there were? Zero. Just take pick a number, one between one and three hundred. Five. Three. Oh, ding, 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 ding. We three. have a winner over here in three. the There's three. Compared and no to- alcohol in their system at the time. Uh, this is strictly marijuana, only THC, DUI, DUID, okay. actually. It's, right, is, it's a DUID. And then uh, DUIs, I think we're at 295. So, you know, less than 1% kind of a thing. Point three percent, maybe. Oh, well, sorry. but I mean, Hemp honestly, joke. it's it, 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 yeah, but it's it's still um, you know, it is St. Patty's Day, so you expect drinking. Well, um, no, but I were I'm actually interested to see um, what this St. Patty's Day DUI numbers look compared to last, to last year's time. Because over the Super they, Bowl, can you can I access that in like two seconds? Oh, uh, you probably Google something like that while I talk. But so over the Super Bowl, right? So last year, are you just Super Bowl, you're just talking about Colorado or Denver? Colorado, Denver. Okay. Denver, Colorado, you know, about the same. So, like, you know, last year's Super Bowl, we had about, like, 400-something, like, high, it might have been higher than that. Maybe, like, 600, something like that, like, real high number, four or 500. And then this year's Super Bowl, where we have our team, God bless their souls. We like to forget about that, you know. <laughs> may, the, may the Broncos rest in peace from that day. Um, you know, we, you know, so not only was our team in that Super Bowl, but we had um, – Less DUIs. We had a hundred less, hundred less, and then they had I think about sixty marijuana DUIs, something like that, or it was like a double digit. It was like sixteen or sixty. I can't remember thirty. God, my math's. Uh, it's t- I should really know these statistics are off the top of my head, but regardless, it was like a ten percent number, and um, and now and I I personally think I would like to see more of these high incident alcohol holidays and weekends. You know, usually like Memorial Day weekend, St. Patty's Day, Fourth of July. You know, we usually see like high DUI numbers now that we have recreational marijuana. Whether or not that brings the numbers down, because we've already seen through several studies with in states of medical marijuana that the the, the, the numbers have gone down. You know, that fatal DUIs have decreased. And it's because, like, people are, like, we can't really, like, say cause, you know, correlation does not equal causation. But, you know, you could theorize that perhaps it's because people are getting high at home and, like, sitting at home. And they're not getting, they're not going out to the bars, getting hammered, making bad decisions. They're just, like, you know, just smoking pot and getting a little lazy. And they just stay at home. And uh, speaking of, like, uh, marijuana DUIs, have you seen the the new ad campaigns? 
So there's actually, I'm sorry, just to give you uh, mm. an idea, um, 481 drivers were arrested for suspected Colorado DUIs last St. Patty's Day. Last St. Patty's Day. And I think we're at 295 now. So it's, so it's down 100 again. It's down a lot. And actually, it went up from 2012 to 2013 because in 2012 it was 424. So it's, it's dropped dramatically this year. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off there. but Oh, you're fine. Just you the, what were you talking about? Um, have you seen the new? Uh, sorry, I got a lawyer question. I had to send the answer. Okay, to. yeah, you, you know. Um, have you seen the new PSAs for the marijuana DUI? I haven't because I haven't been really watching TV recently. Oh, but I heard fucking they're terrible. Terrible. Is this what our eighty-five million dollars that Hickenlooper wants well, to spend is going to go no, towards? No, it's going to be more. And it's it's, it's going to be worse. Oh, well. We'll yeah. see. Yeah. Uh, that's just better just, graphics, probably. We'll talk more about that next week. Um, yeah. No, it's, this is a part of. I think. I think maybe CDOT got like seven million dollars uh, from federal government, but part of it is just like yes. So anyway, just tell us about because not drive while you're high. So like one of them is this guy who's like after <laughs> put the remote in his mouth and he's installing a. The flat screen TV on the wall, and then he like gets he forgets that he's doing it, and then he walks over to where his wife is like set out the like Super Bowl munchies, and they're like, eh. and then the flat screen like crashes to the ground, and it says, "Installing your TV while high is now legal in Colorado. Driving to get a new one is not." So I mean, it just paints like stoner or people who wow. smoke marijuana is like retardedly goofy and like you know like <laughs> and it's like sort of insulting i mean like whatever it could be worse i mean at least they're not like showing i guess like dead bodies all over the street but, but because, you know like, here's some my problem erratic just... high driver had been like running people over but I, I guess like i just don't like the fact that it's perpetuating that stereotype i agree with you and i think when you do it when they do commercials like that you take it less seriously then all they have to do is really just Throw a commercial up and say, hey, you know, like, like, you're not unsimilar to the drunk driving ones where, like, if you drive while well, alcohol, you know, the heat is on or whatever they want to do and just say, by the way, driving while stoned is now considered yeah. illegal. I mean, you don't have to, like, paint a stoner in this, like, stupid image where they're just an idiot. Yeah. And, and then, you know, they have another one where the guy's, like, uh, trying to, like, start his propane girl and he keeps pushing the button and he doesn't realize that, like, it's out of propane and it's, like, you know, Grilling while high is now legal in Colorado. Driving to get a new propane tank is not. So it was just, it's just like, well, whatever. It's like, but to me, this is this is the real question, right? You know what that's telling if me is, you know what? Make sure you have all the shit you need before you smoke weed. And yeah, if you that. can't even take the ad campaign seriously, you can't. If you can't, no. If they, so if the if the sheriffs and the CDOT people and all these like law enforcement individuals who are the driving force behind this campaign, the ones who are crying with their hands out to the governor's office, they sent that letter the other yeah, week saying, know, "We need that. money to retrain our officers because we're having to defer, to divert." For, you know, money. I don't understand the retraining. It was like, wait a minute. Weren't you already trained in the effects of cannabis? Apparently not. Why do you need extra training? Well, now it's they need money to like divert forces. You know, this, what's that it's ride? It's such program? BS. You know, they need they need money to make up for all of the seizures they're not going to be able to take. Yeah, like, when it comes that's to property, pretty much what it is. And yeah. and and the other thing is like, if you can't even take that seriously, like clearly they're not taking it seriously. Like, so you're not even you don't even think it's that serious of an issue that you like want to even throw like or like a legitimate serious campaign behind you just like make a big joke out of it yeah. like fuck you obviously you don't think it's that big of a problem and right. you know it's not you're not if you can't even take it seriously now i know you're full of shit right you liars yeah no Sorry. that's a good point Going that's a good off. point i have to deal with these people later professionally and they'll be like you call me a liar on the radio i go but you're full of shicks. No one listens to our show. <laughs> <laughs> That's not true. <laughs> At least one guy. We, yeah, At least one guy. guy. At least right two here. guys. At least right. fine, That's upstanding right. young gentleman. That's now, right. now, 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 who's listening? On no that one. real negative <laughs> note, um, <laughs> DJ you know, Joe's like, listening. <laughs> all right. Well, we got to go. I'd like to thank our sponsor, Incredibles, for uh, sponsoring this show. And uh, Dude, we're just people do Incredibles. listen. Yeah. No, by the way, people show. really do listen to the show. Otherwise, they're like, ah, yeah, we might not want to do it. It's part of my self-deprecating charm. It is. Don't worry about it. Yeah. Because yeah. she calls it charm, I call it just sad. You're sad. Yeah. Um, so uh, until next week, um, uh, thanks yeah, for listening. That's the note we're going to leave you on is you calling me sad. I'm sorry. What do you want to leave it on? Charming. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you. I'd like to thank the charming Miss uh, Samantha Walsh for joining us. Uh, also, Matt McLean yes, from you. Recreator yes. Hemp Apparel. 
Thank you. Yeah, golf clap for Miss the Charming. No, um, golf clap for our guests. And then, of course, we have Appalachian Man and Bush. Thanks so much for coming out, guys. We really appreciate you. Thanks for jumping Enjoy. the radio. Yeah, it was fun. Enjoyed it. Yeah, I like it you guys. It was a good time. Um, so until next time, uh, peace, love, and... Happiness.